and we are here this morning in case number 18-3078, the Klamath Tribes versus United States Bureau of Reclamation et al. Council, please come forward and state your appearance. Good morning, Your Honor. James Weiner on behalf of the Klamath Tribes. With me at council table is Doug McCourt and Luke Christian. And if I could, we also have some tribal leadership I would like to introduce to you. Certainly. Tribal Council Chairman Don Gentry. Vice Chair Bill Asher. Secretary Roberta Frost. Councilwoman Jeannie Wisnair, Councilman David Ochoa, Councilwoman Kathleen Mitchell, and from the Tribes Natural Resources Aquatics Program, we have Mark Buettner and Brad Parrish. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, Your Honor. Robert Williams for the Federal Defendants. I'm with the Wildlife and Marine Resources Section at the Department of Justice. Welcome back. Thank you. I have some agency representatives with me today I'd like to introduce for the record. Um, from the Klamath Basin Area Office of the Bureau of Reclamation, we have Jeffrey Nettleton, who's the area manager, Tara Jane Campbell Miranda, who is the acting chief of environmental compliance. Uh, we have Megan Skinner, who's the Klamath River manager, and we have Jared Botcher, who is the chief of the Water Operations Division. Um, also, do we have Lauren Meredith? who is uh, with the Mid-Pacific Regional Office of Public Affairs. And with the Klamath Falls Fish and Wildlife Office, we have Evan Childress, who's a senior fish biologist. And from NOAA Fisheries California Coastal Office, we have Lisa Van Atta, who is the Assistant Regional Administrator. Terrific, welcome everybody. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Paul Simmons for the defendant intervenors. I'm with my co-counsel, uh, Rich Deichman and Jared Mueller, We're back at the table. Uh, there are also any number of uh, very interested uh, farmers and ranchers present who, based on an informal poll, the majority drove overnight, <laughs> as far as I can tell, and they're uh, certainly eager to go back to work. <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. Welcome, everybody. All right, uh, so let me tell you how I've analyzed the papers on both motions, uh, and then, uh, then we'll hear argument. So let me start uh, with the venue motion. It seems to me that whether venue exists in the Northern District is a close question, but there's no question that the District of Oregon is a more appropriate place uh, for the case to be. The tribe's headquarters are there, the sucker fish are there, the lake is there, the Bureau of Reclamation and Fish and Wildlife Service have offices there. So the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, which is named in the third count, is located here, but I have concerns about the plausibility of the third count, uh, especially given the reinitiation of consultation a year and a half before the lawsuit was filed. Um, that I have a case that involves the Lower Klamath uh, doesn't provide venue. Um, while there may be some relationship in, the, in light of the amount of water that's released from the Upper Klamath Lake into the river, I found no case that suggests such an environmental impact would create venue. And even if the third count is plausible, and I can consider the prudential usefulness of one judge determining all the issues involved in the Klamath project, the relationship to this case in the District of Oregon is just much stronger, it seems to me. So that's how I look at venue. Um, if I stick with that tentative, then it's gonna be up to a judge uh, in the District of Oregon to uh, determine how to protect the endangered sucker fish, which all parties agree are threatened uh, today because of the allegations of irreparable harm and the debate over venue, I have considered the tribe's motion for preliminary uh, injunction, uh, and I, I do wanna hear argument about that today. Um, I'm not convinced that the tribes are gonna prevail either on the merits, uh, uh, on the merits, and it's not clear to me that the remedy that, uh, that they're seeking um, is gonna provide the benefit that they hope for the sucker fish. So I'm gonna lay out my thinking about that. And it's obviously without prejudice to whatever the transferee judge determines um, in the case going forward. 
But it seems to me first that this is a different case than the Hoopa Valley case uh, and the Yurok tribe cases involving the coho salmon. There, the uh, 2013 biop set um, standards for the take rate, and there is a specific remedy if the take rates were exceeded, which was reinitiation of consultation, which the government failed to do uh, when the take rates were exceeded. And the remedy there was based on the best sciences outlined in, among other things, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, technical memos. Here, consultation was reinitiated appropriately prior to suit, and the defendants have complied with the uh, biop. When lake levels failed uh, to meet thresholds, the Bureau investigated, consulted with Fish and Wildlife, uh, and concluded that the biop's still operative. Uh, moreover, there's a dispute whether the take rates have been exceeded. Uh, and the biop provided several reasons why substantial adverse effects to the suckerfish might not be minimized by higher lake uh, elevation levels. The experts disagree about that. Um, the biop recognized also that the suckerfish are at continued risk of disease and entrainment and still made the no jeopardy finding. And so for all those reasons, I think the presumption of regularity with respect to the biop still applies. So I find that this is a, a close case uh, on both the merits and the equities, but the motion before me is seeking an extraordinary remedy. And while the interest of the species, the protected species, is paramount, I need to consider it in the context of complex competing interests that are affected, including the lower Klamath, um, the ranchers and the farmers who rely on the water from the upper Klamath Lake, wildlife refuges, and so forth. So before affecting those interests, I need to know how effective the remedy is likely to be and where there are competing expert opinions regarding the harm caused by lower lake elevations than suggested in the biop, where there's no consensus on remedies to protect the suckerfish, and where there's no violation of the biop that's clearly shown. Uh, I, I don't think the plaintiffs have met their burden for this extraordinary remedy, but this is all without prejudice uh, to the tribes renewing this motion uh, in front of a transferee judge, and it is a tentative. So I, I hope to be, uh, I hope both parties will point out things about what I've just said that uh, may not be accurate. So let's uh, start, Mr. Weiner, with you. Thank you, Your Honor. On the venue question, um, the thing that I think we would emphasize most strongly is that venue does not require the most appropriate forum. It is any forum that has a substantial connection to the claims. Yeah. And that being the case, uh, the general default position is that the plaintiff's choice of venue, therefore, should be accorded a great deal of deference. Yeah, but the plaintiffs here um, are located in another, in another district. So there's a little less deference that's provided um, in choosing. And I can understand, I mean, I, Th there is sense in having um, one judge. You could certainly argue that one judge ought to handle all the uh, issues coming out of the river. I haven't, but I haven't found any case that suggests that that's a decent reason for venue. So then it just relates back to the National Marine Fisheries, uh, which is a weak read, it seems to me, in this case. Well, and Judge, I don't think it hinges only on no fisheries, uh, because the reason for that is that the venue case law talks about significant events or omissions occurring in the district. And I think that the thing that we would stress the most strongly is that the 2013 biop is a product of the Northern District of California. It's also a product of the District of Oregon, and also, as intervener defendants have pointed out, of the Eastern District of California. But because of the specific way that this biop was put together and the close coordination between NOAA Fisheries and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation, 
in all three districts. And because of the fact that there was not a bright line drawn, despite what the federal defendants are currently trying to say, there is not a bright line in terms of how the BIOP was approached from a technical or a policy level as between the COHO issues and the Chuam and the COPTU issues, the, the sucker issues. And for that reason, we would submit that it is in fact the 2013 BIOP itself that provides the sufficient and significant nexus to this district, not just for NIPS, but also for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation. And so while we do believe, and I'll certainly be happy to address your count three issues and our claims against NIMFS, um, and that NIMFS certainly would provide a basis for pendant venue uh, to the extent that you don't, you would you'd be otherwise disinclined to find venue independently for reclamation of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Our overarching theory here is that the BIOP itself and the process that led to it, including the process that implements it through the FASTA team, the cooperating agencies that are working on those with the other stakeholders, all of those things are really the significant nexus that exists. Because what the venue talks about, and the, the purpose of the venue statute, really is about ultimately protecting procedural fairness to the defendants. And that's why the case law draws all of the distinctions that it does between personal jurisdiction, which is the minimum contacts analysis, and venue, which really has to do with is there a connection between the defendants and the district. And in this case, we think that that, con that connection is very strong, predominantly due to the existence of the buyout. And what's, so, it, what's the best case that you have that uh, it would be the biop that would con uh, that would create the venue as opposed to everything else? Uh, there are several cases from the Northern District itself. There is Martinson, Martinson versus Koch or Koch. I don't know how to pronounce that one. Uh, Nine forty two F sub second nine eighty three which talks about the importance of looking at the underlying sequence of events giving rise to the claim. There's a similar holding in the Northern District of California in Legal Editions LLC versus Kowalski, uh, which is not reported, but I can give you a Westlaw citation, and it's actually cited by the federal defendants in their briefing. Uh, and then, although there is no binding Ninth Circuit case law on point, multiple other circuit courts of appeal have again talked about the importance of looking to the underlying sequence of events. And cases such as Uffner versus La Reunion Francaise out of the First Circuit, First Co Michigan Corp versus Bramlett out of the Sixth Circuit, Setco Enterprises Corp versus Robbins out of the Eighth Circuit. All of those cases talk about the fact that for venue, you can look to the underlying course of events giving rise to the claims. And our claim is absolutely about reclamation's implementation of the 2013 BIOP. And the BIOP, therefore, is at the core of the claims. The federal defendants in their briefing have put significant amount of emphasis on that you need to start with looking at the defendant's actions and that it is specifically the defendant's actions that tie you to the forum. And that's where they get into all the arguments about Oregon this and Oregon that. And we certainly agree Oregon is a proper forum. Um, but because we believe the venue case law provides for venue in multiple forums, supports venue in multiple forums, including this one on the facts of the case, our interest in having a comprehensive, holistic look at the system is why we chose to come down here from Oregon, because we believe that it is appropriate and it is, in fact, critical to make sure that we are not setting up different federal courts to issue potentially competing decisions. And that goes back, Your Honor, to the reason that the federal defendants are doing joint biops. In 2008, Fish and Wildlife Service issued an independent biop for the Chuam and the Koptu. In 2010, NOAA Fisheries issued an independent buyout for the COHO, and it was very quickly discovered that there was a great potential for conflict in certain circumstances based on the operations that were being indicated in both of those biops, which is what led very directly to the joint and collaborative process that led to the 2013 buyout that the federal defendants have described as part of the reconsultation. And obviously, I'll get to your concerns about the reconsultation. Um, and that have gone through the implementation. And so for those reasons, um, the need for coordination is very important. And, and I, I want to just take a second on the, on the need for coordination and the holistic consideration piece, uh, because there, there have been a lot of aspersions cast about why the tribes have brought this suit in the first place. Uh, and this is absolutely not about the tribes trying to be vindictive to their neighbors, trying to put farmers out of business. This is at core because the fish are in incredible peril. And we recognize that the coho have issues as well, that Klamath tribes have a treaty interest in coho salmon as well. And it's important to us to make sure that the system is looked at holistically and comprehensively. 
It's why we support and have supported the collaborative approach that went into the 2013 biop. The Klamath tribes were very involved in the promulgation of the 2013 biop, and even after the biop was issued, have been invested in trying to make it work. It's why the Klamath tribes took the technical lead in the process that led to the effort to fix the threshold calculations afterward. We've been deeply involved and deeply invested in trying to make this system work. Uh, in tandem, while the buyout process was going on, the tribes were trying to engage with their neighbors in a comprehensive approach that led to the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement. And I know there is now a ton of, frankly, irrelevant material in the record from intervener defendants on the Klamath Basin adjudication on the water rights side of things, which we agree with intervener defenders is not relevant to this case. But the point that I am making is that we have tried very, very hard to find comprehensive and holistic ways to address these issues, and we continue to believe that a comprehensive and holistic solution needs to be found. But the concern that we have, and the reason that we brought this suit, and this is a chart from one of the exhibits attached to uh, the Intervenor Defendant's Declaration of Mark Johnson. This is uh, docket number 42-4. Um, this is the abundance of the COP2, of the short-nosed suckers. And under the biop that the federal defendants claim is working well and that they are following, we have seen 80% fewer short-nosed suckers in the period from 2001 to 2016 that the USGS data covers. And that data does not include last year, which is 2017, which is the first time in many years, fortunately, but is the first time that we have seen yet another significant sucker die-off. And so the abundance of these species continues to diminish dramatically, and the importance of an acute remedy to address their needs, we believe, is absolutely critical. But we need to make sure that that is done in such a way that balances exactly the kinds of concerns that you are talking about, certainly with the coho, who are also endangered, with the wildlife refuges, with the irrigation project, and all of these things that need to fit together. And so for that reason, that is, comes back to the point of why, because we believe the venue case law strongly supports venue in this district. We believe that it is important to stay in this district to make sure that there is exactly that sort of holistic consideration of the system. Okay, well let me uh, get Mr. Williams to come up here and, uh, and then the interveners and then we'll go on to the uh, merits. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Poirier is prepared to- Oh, even better. Well, she's, she's prepared to address the motion to dismiss if you'd like to hear from the government on that. I'm prepared to address the motion for preliminary injunction. Okay, I'm, I, I'm interested in the venue at this point. Okay. Good morning, Your Honor. Morning. Your Honor, we agree that plaintiff has failed to meet its burden of establishing that venue is proper in this district. This case must be dismissed, or as Your Honor suggests, in the interest of justice, transferred to an appropriate venue. Now before I get into the substance, I would like to clarify that federal defendants filed a motion to dismiss for improper venue. We did not file a motion to transfer. And we believe this is a critical distinction, because when a court isn't confronted with a motion to dismiss for improper venue, it's simply the only inquiry is whether the allegations in plaintiff's complaint meet one of the four bases for venue that exist in 28 U.S.C. 1391. Contrary to plaintiff's suggestions, the court doesn't need to look at the convenience of the parties or whether there's a possibility for conflicting injunctions or other factors that you would consider in a motion to transfer. It's simply whether plaintiff's allegations in the complaint rise to the level of venue existing under the statute. Yeah, and so get to the, the issue on the, with the biop. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the central issue that's being argued. Sure. You know, in, in plaintiff's view, the 2013 biop is one of these significant events that are in a sequence underlying all of the tribe's claims. However, plaintiff takes the venue analysis in this a few steps too far. As this court has held, the first step in analyzing whether venue is proper under this statute is to identify the defendant's alleged wrongful acts. Once those wrongful acts are identified, then we can determine whether a substantial part of them occurred in this district. And in this case, as plaintiff states multiple times in its PI briefing, plaintiff has not challenged the 2013 buyup at all, whether the sucker portion or the salmon portion. In fact, if I can quote from plaintiff's reply brief here, it says, the tribes are not before this court challenging the substance of the 2013 buyup itself. Rather, the tribes' claims are predicated on the fact that it is reclamation's actions and the hydrologic conditions that have occurred since the issuance of the 2013 buyup that render reclamation's operation of the project 
violative of the Section 7 and 9 of the ESA. So plaintiff itself admits that the 2013 BIOP is not an issue in this case, but they asked the court to look back at a BIOP that NIMS created for salmon, in this case about suckers and Fish and Wildlife Service and Reclamation. Additionally, out of all the alleged acts and wrongful acts in plaintiff's complaint, the only allegation against NIMS is that it failed to reinitiate appropriate consultation regarding the project's effects on suckers. And Your Honor, NIMS has no jurisdiction over suckers, statutorily or by regulation. It therefore has no legal authority or duty to reinitiate consultation on suckers. In fact, according to our declarant, Mr. Simonday from NIMS, NIMS does not even have the expertise to comment, or comment on or write any of the analysis regarding suckers. It just simply is not its species and it can't be um, used to hinge venue on in this lawsuit. And what about the, uh, do you want to distinguish the cases that, uh, that Mr. Weiner described? Well, I believe those cases, most of those cases came from either the First or Third Circuit, talking about, um, I believe the Third Circuit case is about a yacht that caught fire and now there's a, a case regarding the insurance claims. So those things are kind of directly correlated. In this case, um, plaintiffs brought a suit regarding ESA Section 7 and Section 9 violations against reclamation and fish and wildlife for failure to reinitiate. And now they're trying to look back to a biop that is about salmon for nymphs and try to hinge it, that on venue. And I just believe that this is a case where they are hoping that venue exists in this district where it is not the case. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so let's go on. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, please. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, and this, uh, this issue was well briefed and well argued by the federal defendants. So I just want to make a couple of points. You're quite right that the, that the plaintiff is in Oregon, the lake is in Oregon, Link River Dam is Oregon, the species are in Oregon. There is no living sucker in this district at all. Um, and it's worthwhile knowing, Your Honor, I think it's no surprise, there are actually cu currently four consolidated lawsuits pending in the District of Oregon just over the hill in Medford that concern the Klamath Project, and one of them actually involves suckers in a way, albeit suckers in Clear Lake in Modoc County, but it's a, it's a big mess. Um, with respect to the biop, I do think it's important to emphasize that the plaintiffs aren't challenging the biop, um, and, 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 and even that would be, would be irrelevant. There are necessarily, as a matter of law, two biops simply because each agency is required by Section 7 of the ESA to issue a biop on its species of concern. The coordination actually occurred through the development of the proposed action and this iterative process that both agencies would consult on made all the sense in the world. The plaintiffs um, plead that they're trying to make sure everything is coordinated. Uh, their, their motion for injunction fails that test. If this injunction were issued, I can assure you the Bureau of Reclamation would have no idea what to do, given the competing river issues and where, and where that is. Um, so this is not a matter of a dilution flow that you, know, you kind of have to squeeze out and just short, short ag, which is what happens. It's not that. And, and then finally, with respect to the NIMS employees, I've just asked that the court consider changing one fact and a hypothetical, and that is this. If, um, if the NIMS employees were in uh, Minot, North Dakota, instead of Arcata, would the District of North Dakota um, be a proper venue for this case? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so let's go on to the, uh, the merits of, of the preliminary injunction. So Your Honor, on the merits, there are multiple things, obviously, that, that I need to cover based on the issues that you raised. I think the, the important place to start, and this ties in a little bit to something that both the federal defendants and inter intervener defendants just touched on, um, which is the, the issue with the 2013 BIOP and exactly what it is that we are challenging. Uh, and to be clear, we, and we said it in the reply brief, you just had it read to you, we are not bringing an APA claim or an ESA citizen suit claim against the 20... Uh, sorry, an, an ESA citizen suit claim against the BIOP as it was promulgated. As I said, we worked hard to try to put that BIOP together. That BIOP was done with the best of intentions, and that BIOP was intended to lead to higher lake levels. The BIOP specifically talked about that, and that was one of the factors that was hardwired in to their reaching the no jeopardy conclusion. 
What has happened subsequently, and this is directly what our claims relate to, is that reclamation has not managed consistent with what was assumed and anticipated in the biop to be consistently well above the thresholds. And so that is one factor. And then the second factor is the climatic conditions that we have seen since the biop occurred put us outside of what was modeled in the biop period of record. And so what you have and what Fish and Wildlife Service and Reclamation have done in their consultation and coordination project process that you described and that you described as being compliant with the biop, they have looked at each individual threshold brief, breach and said, okay, here's why that one happened, fine. Here's why that one happened, fine. Here's why that one happened, fine. Um, I think that there are some, some real legitimate questions about Fish and Wildlife Services signing off on the breach that occurred in 2016, where there was the release, the flood control release by Pacific Corps, and where there was the sudden decrease in inflows. Because what both of those things demonstrate is that reclamation is not operating with an appropriate buffer to protect the fish. They are putting the burden of risk of every management decision they make on the fish by running this as close to the line as they possibly can. And that is not consistent with what the 2013 biop built into it as a critical assumption that they would continue to manage to levels and levels would occur well above the threshold. And so that's the management piece. Uh, you've heard in, in the de many of the declarations that have been submitted by both the defendants and the intervener defendants, uh, probably especially the intervener defendant declarations, that none of the individual threshold breaches have necessarily individually caused acute and attributable harm to the suckers. But part of what was built into the no jeopardy conclusion itself was that the fish would be able to consistently enjoy higher levels than occurred in the past. And between reclamation's operational decisions and the way that the hydrology has come in, because the biop was predicated on interannual variability, right? You, get to, you set the levels based on what mother nature brings us. The fact that we have consistently seen dry year after dry year after dry year with only a couple of interruptions uh, over the last decade, in fact, you then are in a situation where the fish, because of the way the threshold mechanisms at work, are consistently facing lower lake levels year in, year out, which is very different than what the biop had forecast. And so our attack is not on the biop as it was promulgated in 2013. And if you look, for example, at the technical, the technical report, that the federal defendants submitted on June 27th as Exhibit A to their opposition brief. Uh, it spends a fair amount of time defending the science that went into the 2013 biop. And as of 2013, we don't have a particular issue with that, and that certainly is not the gravamen of our claims today that we are bringing in this suit. And so this distinction they're trying to draw that somehow, since we're not challenging the 2013 biop as it was promulgated, therefore takes the biop off the table, I think is inconsistent and is not what we are doing because what we are saying is that the biop assumed a certain set of things and those things have not been borne out. And so to continue to operate as though the 2013 biop is still valid and controlling, that is the core of the jeopardy allegation we are making and it relates to the take allegation as well. All right, so, so go ahead and, and get to, given that um, uh, state of facts, uh, and the fact that consultation has been reinitiated uh, and that the experts disagree apparently on uh, uh, the effect of the remedy that you're looking for, what's the, where, uh, where is a court supposed to intervene uh, and why isn't the consultation among the experts the appropriate way uh, to be proceeding? Those are excellent questions, Your Honor. Let me start with the reconsultation piece first because I think this is very important. Um, in their briefing, the federal defendants talk about as though reconsultation on the Chuam and the COP2 were initiated in January 2017. Uh, that's not at all what they have said among the, at the staff level, at the agency level, and the correspondence that has gone back and forth since then. The letter that Area Director Nettleton sent to Fish and Wildlife Service on January 4th, 2017, and I will grab that. If I can figure out which one it is. This was an, an exhibit to the Kirby Declaration from Intervenor Defendants Filings. This is document number 40-6. 
Uh, it's a January 4th, 2017 memo from Jeff Nettleton with reclamation to Lori Seda at the Fish and Wildlife Service. And what it says is, the purpose of this letter is to clarify that reclamation has reinitiated formal consultation with NMFS and USFWS on the effects of the Klamath project to address the exceedance of take associated with coho salmon disease infection rates that occurred during 2014 and 2015, pursuant to 50 CFR sections 402.14 I4 and 402.16. And what that statement by itself does is it belies the arguments that federal defendants have made in their briefing that it is somehow axiomatic that because they're consulting with Fish and Wildlife Service, they're automatically consulting about suckers. That's not what it says. That's not what they said they were doing when they filed this on the eve of the Yurok and Hoopa hearing, summary judgment hearing in your court. Um, and, that's part, and that really is what lies at the heart of our issues in the re, with the reconsultation, which is that until the Fish and Wildlife Service technical memorandum of June 27th, which was filed you know, in the midst of this litigation, that was the first time that the Fish and Wildlife Service ever actually said that they recognized that there has been new science that has developed since the 2013 biop that meets the triggers for reconsultation on Schwamm and COP2. Prior to that point, and, and frankly, Mr. Williams stood in front of your court in April um, and, said, and talked about where the reconsultation was. You were frustrated as to where things stood, and he'd mentioned you know, where things were as on the COHO reconsultation, and then mentioned, by the way, that our 60-day notice had been filed, and that meant they were probably going to have to add sucker issues to the mix as well, which was going to slow things down even further which again suggests that they have not, prior to June 27th, when they finally put it in writing and have acknowledged it in a filing to this court, not one they actually shared with us first, um, that reconsultation on the Chwam and the COP2 issues has actually begun. And so we don't think it's appropriate for them simply to hide behind the general reconsultation that they initiated, which was specifically geared to the Sea Shasta issues to say we've been in reconsultation for a year and a half and therefore your reconsultation theory is, is dead and gone. And because of the timing on that, we think this is in fact much more analogous to the situation that you found yourself in in Yurok and Hoopa, where there has been a substantial procedural violation of the obligation to reinitiate that they may have immediately cured, but the risk that we have seen with the delay, with the continued trend and the diminishment of the species, therefore means that an injunctive relief at the merits stage is a potential remedy for us for our reinitiation, our reinitiation complaint and or count. And so for that reason, we don't think that it is accurate simply to conclude they've been in reinitiation a year and a half. We're just trying to mechanistically follow the Yurok and Hoopa playbook because they won and we want to win too. That's not what's going on here. Um, our concern very directly, and we emphasize this in the 60-day notice, we have tried to raise these concerns during the course of the reconsultation process. We have been included in the reconsultation process. They've opened it to stakeholders. But all that, we've, all that they have said is, you know, if you have things you want us to look at, we will consider them. That's all they said in their response to our 60-day notice. They didn't say we're reconsulting on Chwam and COP2. Um, I can pull. But so, uh, are you just saying that these issues, the suckerfish issues, have in fact been discussed since January of 2017? It just hasn't been formally recognized that they were being discussed? Uh, no, Your Honor, it's that we have tried to raise them with, with no success that we've seen. This is part of why we included uh, in our briefing the discussion of the modeling request that we made. And we've asked them to model the, imp the potential impacts of some of these things, and they have not done it. Uh, the issue that we really have, and you see it also, and, and I sh I'm sure we'll talk more about this when you talk about the, the battle. Can you try to slow down? Yes, I apologize. <laughs> um, well, we, we will talk more about this when we get into the technical merits. Um, but as you, will, as you see from their filings, it's not that they are disagreeing with what we are pointing to about the water quality, water quantity nexus, and the recent science and research it's been, that's been done with that. They are refusing to recognize its existence. From both the federal defendants and the intervener defendants, all that they want to talk about on the water quality, water quantity link is the 2004 NRC report and the 2007 Morris report. They completely, it's not even that there's a disagreement, they just ignore and completely disengage from the water quality work that has been done since then, 
publicly presented in testimony in the Klamath Basin adjudication, that work that a federal contractor has continued to do, including presenting it to Reclamation and the Fish and Wildlife Service last fall. Um, you know, it's one thing if they're saying, okay, you know, we disagree with it, it may be provisional, but all that the ESA requires is best available science. And to date, at least, they have simply refused to engage with it all, at all. And that we find incredibly problematic. Okay, so let's go on to the science. Sure. Okay, so what you've heard from the defendants, the intervener defendants, and everything they've submitted is that we're missing the boat, that lake levels don't fix anything. And what we would say is that that is a distortion of what it is that we are saying and what it is that we are showing in the science that we bring to bear. We agree there is not a one-to-one -one linear relationship. Lake levels are not a perfect fix. They are not a cure-all. They will not keep every fish alive. They will not fix the recruitment problem. If that was all that it took, we would have expected it would have been done a long time ago. The issue that we have is that this is a complicated system with a lot of different variables. And the case that we are making is that there are many of those variables we can't control. We can't control wind speed. We can't control temperature. What we can control are lake elevations and to do it in ways that therefore give the species the best chance of survival. That's what we're here advocating for. And also to be clear, we are not here on some sort of basic, simplistic, more water is always better dogma. Uh, that is certainly something that the, the, both the federal defendants and particularly the intervener defendants have suggested. And if you look at the science that we have put together that underlie our conservation levels, we are fully acknowledging and saying that what we have, and this is one of the failings with both the NRC report and the Mars report, because they're looking for linear relationships that only move in one direction. And so if they didn't see that always higher lake levels always make things better, they said there's no connection. What we are saying and what we believe the science shows is that in fact there are bands in which lake elevations matter. That if you have too low elevations, you run into problems both for habitat and survivability, as well as for water quality. But particularly in the later summer periods, if you have too much water in the lake, you also exacerbate water quality periods, water quality problems. And that is why for our late season flows especially, we have very deliberately looked at numbers that both provide adequate habitat space because one of the absolutely critical things that has to happen for these fish because the quality of Upper Klamath Lake is very poor and that's particularly true this year and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute with the exigency that we face. Um, but the fish need to be able to get to the few areas of refuge in the lake to shelter from the worst of the water quality conditions. And to do that, you need lake elevations of a certain level, both to, ex to access those water quality refuges, but then once the fish are there, if there is not enough depth for them to have space to live, they get crowded in too closely together. They are therefore more susceptible to disease, to parasites. They're forced closer to the surface, to avian predation. And so those are important factors for late season lake levels. But at the same time, too much water in the lake can also exacerbate the water quality problems that exist. And that is why we very deliberately, based on where the science took us, suggested levels that are essentially intermediate levels. And, and, and defendant and intervener sort of mocked that as, you know, they didn't use the phrase Goldilocks, but you know, we want it to be just right and to calibrate it perfectly. Um, it's not, that's not arbitrary, Your Honor. That is because what the science suggests that there is this interplay between the water quality and the water quantity. And that is precisely the science, not that they disagree with, but that they have absolutely and utterly refused to engage with. And so it's not that there is a disagreement on this water quality work. It's that they want to pretend that the water quality science stopped in 2007. They point to the 2013 BIOP, and the 2013 BIOP also did rely on those two documents and did not engage with this water quality work also. And the reason for that, by and large, and the 2013 BIOP talks about this directly, is that a fair amount of the water quality work was developed in the conjunction of advancing the tribe's claims in the Klamath Basin adjudication. And again, to be clear, we are not trying to import our claims here. This is not a water rights case in any way, shape, or form. We are going where we believe the science and the Endangered Species Act take us. But what we are saying, what the biop said, I'm sorry, is that because the KBA process was developing administratively in the state of Oregon on essentially the, tam the same time frame, as the 2013 BIOP was being developed, that none of that information was really available to them to use because it was, still in a contested, it was still in a contested process. The administrative phase of the KBA concluded 
that information is still out there and publicly presented, and the scientists who worked on that have continued to work since then to refine their analysis of the water quality, water quantity link further, and yet there is still no engagement with that. And so that, again, goes back to why we don't think that what we are dealing with here is a difference of opinion on the science or a battle of experts. Uh, it's simply that there is a refusal to engage. And that's a very different situation, and part of why we believe that simply relying on the reconsultation process by itself and just waiting it out and then hoping for an outcome on the other side, that's a piece of why we think that's insufficient. And then the other piece is that we don't believe the fish can wait. Because let me talk just a little bit about the exigency of what we're facing and why we think this is so important now. Go ahead. Which is that I showed you before, I can, I can pull it again, the, the, char the chart of the population declines. And the period of record of that chart was 2001 to 2016. And as I mentioned, we didn't see significant die-offs that year. Uh, the USGS report, the Hewitt report talked that in, year in, sorry, being in those years. Okay. In that period of record, there were not significant die-offs. The Hewitt report, uh, which was attached to, I believe, the Kirby Declaration. I can find that for you. I can get the citation for you. Um, that was the USGS report from 2018 looking at the, basically the population census and how many were left. Uh, what, it, what it talked about was that during those years, there were a few small die-offs, but nothing significant, which was great and for which we're thankful. Unfortunately, their period of record ended in 2016, and in 2017, we saw a significant die-off of both Chuam and COP2. Me measurable material, hundreds of dead fish were collected, and as the biop itself talks about in its take discussion, and I'll, I'll come to that on the take issue, um, it's very difficult to sometimes find dead fish in a lake that size. They often get eaten. And so the fact that we collected several hundred is indicative that many, many more most likely died. And that conclusion is supported by provisional USGS data that came out this June looking at spawning returns. Uh, the populations of both species got hammered in 2017. And so we are now looking at a situation of significantly less abundance even than we saw last year. That by itself is problematic, but then it gets worse because one of the things that we saw in the 1990s was that there was a series of die-offs because one of the things that happens even to fish who survive in a year with a significant die-off, and the thinking is that last year's die-off was predominantly water quality driven, is that those who survive are often in the weakened condition, and therefore they are less able to survive adverse conditions the following year. And what we've seen this year is that the Oregon Department of Health put out a water quality advisory on Upper Klamath Lake in June, which is very early. And we are already seeing water quality conditions in the lake dramatically, dramatically degrading. To the point, in fact, the dead fish, dead chuam, were collected this week by the area of Pelican Bay, which is one of the most critical water quality refuges. This is very early in the season for Chuam and COP2 to begin to move to Pelican Bay. They normally prefer other habitat in the July period. And so the fact that they are already moving in that direction is indicative that there is a real problem for the fish's survivability in the lake this summer. And the fact that they are turning up dead in Pelican Bay this week, which again is early because the worst of the water quality problems are most typically in August and September, bespeak the fact that we are quite potentially looking at a second consecutive significant die-off event. And when we were starting coming out of 2016, as best USGS could estimate, and they felt pretty good about their population estimates on the COP2, on the short-nosed suckers, with perhaps 20,000 surviving fish. We lose, we're not sure how many we lost last year, but if the 40% decrease in spawning returns that USGS has documented this spring tracks mortality, we could be as low as 11 or 12,000 fish coming into 2018. And if we look at that rate of loss again, we are looking at an, ex at an extinct population. This is not hypothetical. This is not, you know, well, there's a chance, but there's a chance every year, you know, it's a risk, who knows, which is basically how the defendant and defendant interveners are presenting it. What we are looking at is a real and serious acute threat to the continued existence of the COP2 as a species. And that that is real, and then that has occurred over the last two years in particularly adverse lake conditions. And that is the critical hair of fire emergency as to why we are before you seeking what we fully acknowledge is an extraordinary remedy. We know that we are asking for a mandatory injunction. We know we have an inordinately heavy burden to lift to be able to get there. But we believe that the exigency of the situation and the merits of our claims based on how reclamation has operated the project over the last five, six years 
are sufficient to clear that burden. All right. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at the outset, we think obviously the court's tentative ruling on venue is, is quite appropriate and correct, and the court doesn't need to reach any of this for, for that reason. Um, but to, to speak to the motion for preliminary injunction, uh, as Mr. Weiner just said, this court has been asked to take an extraordinary action. Um, this is not about preserving the status quo. This is about installing a wholly new and radical status quo before the merits are even decided. This is talking about new lake elevations for 10 months out of the year uh, for Upper Klamath Lake. This new regime is untested and it lacks any of the analyses and the safeguards that are in the existing biological opinion from the expert agency that's charged with protecting this species. And this type of relief is particularly disfavored in the law and it's subject to a heightened standard. Um, that type of request must be denied unless the law and the facts clearly favor the moving party and that heightened standard is wholly unsatisfied here on the law and the facts. There is no legal violation that is ongoing. There is um, no likelihood of, of extreme or serious damage that is imminent. And against this backdrop, we've got a re an injunction that's being requested that can't even be implemented consistent with the Bureau's other obligations for coho salmon and, and this other, the court's other injunction for coho salmon. Um, and, and that um, speaks nothing to the other devastating consequences that would flow from this injunction to the ongoing consultation, to the wildlife refuges, um, and, and to flood control operations, not the least of which to mention the devastating impacts it would have to the local area by shutting off a complete shutdown of irrigation deliveries in the middle of the growing season. Okay, um, so, so Mr. Williams, because we've um, seen each other in other circumstances, you know that my view of the law is that uh, the paramount interest that I have to consider under the law is the endangered species. So I'd be interested in your speaking to um, the exigencies that Mr. Weiner was uh, describing at the end and then to the consultation process that's occurred over the last year and a half. Sure, Your Honor. Uh, the timing question is important here, right, because we're talking about a preliminary injunction. We're not looking at off at some indefinite period of time. We're looking at the time between when the complaint was filed and when this case can be decided on the merits. Um, there is no emergency in that period of time um, that justifies requesting a, a preliminary injunction. There's no concrete event or occurrence that's imminent and likely to cause extreme or serious damage. For the last five years, under this biological opinion, the status quo has been the proposed action that was analyzed in that biological opinion. Um, and this year, the Bureau is, is continuing to implement that same proposed action. And every year, for the last five years, there have been irrigation deliveries. So it's not like the Bureau is poised to take some new action that the plaintiffs are, are coming to this court to try and stop. No, no, but, but speak to what Mr. Weiner was, uh, was just saying. He's, he said that um, the suckerfish are on the verge of extinction as a result of what's happened in the last two years. So what's the government's uh, perspective on that? With all due respect to Mr. Weiner, I think it's hyperbole, Your Honor. Um, his own declarant doesn't say that there is some imminent risk of a catastrophic die-off event. And certainly the government agencies don't believe that is true. Um, at most, the plaintiff is saying there's a possibility. There was an event that happened last year in 2017. We don't have the survival data quite yet. I think that won't be available until next year. But before that event, you have to go back, I think, 14 years for the last similar type of event um, in 1986, I believe, and then, or sorry, uh, and then before that, you're going back to the 1990s. Uh, so it's, it's a risk that's been present for decades. Um, 
and there's no evidence before the court on the record here that shows there's somehow an imminent risk that this is likely. And again, I would go back to the Supreme Court's decision in Winter versus NRDC, and the Supreme Court made it abundantly clear a preliminary injunction can't be issued. No, no, I understand the law. I'm, I'm really interested in the facts at this point to try to uh, drill down. So tell me about consultation. What's been happening in the last year and a half with respect to the sucker fish and the consultation? Sure. I think it's important with, the cons with respect to consultation to be start at the beginning, which is when you enter into consultation, you're consulting on a proposed action. So here the proposed action is operation of the Klamath project. You can't reinitiate consultation on that proposed action and think about changing that proposed action without involving both agencies and both species. The idea that the Bureau was only going to reinitiate with nymphs with respect to coho salmon and talk about maybe changing the proposed action without <laughs> consulting with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, on suckers is, is simply just not plausible. Uh, the idea was, yes, that was the trigger for the reinitiation was, was what was going on with salmon, but they were looking at that proposed action and by necessity they had to consult with both agencies um, and, and they're revisiting the biological opinion. And if I could, Your Honor, um, oh, this has gone dark on me. I would refer the court to the Fish and Wildlife Service's technical report that we submitted with our preliminary injunction opposition. And they speak directly to the ongoing consultation and they, they um, summarize their work that they're currently doing. And I was gonna read a passage from that which I think might be helpful here. Um, on page four of that document, there's a heading entitled Reconsultation Process, and it says, quote, the service recognizes that new and additional science on suckers has come to light since the signing of the 2013 BIOP. Reclamation is currently consulting with the service and the National Marine Fishery Service on a new joint biological opinion and expects to complete consultation expeditiously. The suggested relationship between lake level and water quality that is the basis for the tribe's complaint is just one part of the broad and complex scientific landscape that will be assessed within the context of sucker survival and recovery under the current reconsultation. I don't know how more clearly they could say it, that they are looking at suckers, they are working expeditiously on a new biological opinion that will address a lot of the concerns that the tribe has here, but in terms of what's currently before the court, this, this injunction, I think the theory is sort of on the plaintiff's side is, well, the species is endangered and let's just presume that there's a likelihood or, or possibility and that's just not enough to satisfy the legal standard when we're talking about this extraordinary type of relief. So how long do you think, the, the last time that, uh, that you were here, we were talking about the length of time it takes um, which was, you were educating me on how long it takes in order to get a new biological opinion in place or, and deal with um, uh, the specific issues that I was concerned about with the coho. How long is it gonna take for uh, this uh, consultation to address specifically the problems that uh, the suckerfish have? I thought your honor might ask that question. Um, just to give you a sense, the, the folks behind me, you know, are working hard, very expeditiously on this. When, when they set up coordination um, meetings and they make announcements, there's 150 different stakeholders that are involved in those. So that just gives you an idea of the, of the enormity of it and the complexities that, that are going into it. Uh, when I was here in front of you in, in April, we talked about um, spring of 2020 was, was the anticipated um, completion date. Uh, they're working um, on expediting that schedule. Um, I, I'm not in a position to offer a new um, anticipated completion date, but I can assure you it's a high priority 
at, at the highest levels within the agencies, and they want to get this biological opinion done um, as badly as anybody does. They're, they're really working hard on it. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so I, I can continue, or if the court has specific questions. Um, it, well, I guess the, um, one of the uh, points that Mr. Reiner was making was uh, a failure to engage with uh, the science basically since 2007. So it hasn't, so what's happened up till this point uh, hasn't really focused on what the problem uh, is uh, with the sucker fish. Do you have any specific response to that other than saying, of course, that's not true because our people always talk about everything? Well, I think going back to the tech memo that's in front of the court um, on this record here, the Fish and Wildlife Service has confirmed that they believe the biological opinion is the best available science. Um, you know, they, they stand behind that. Um, there is new information that's come about, um, and that's going to be looked at as part of the, the new consultation, but it's not their opinion that lake levels need to be raised at this point to either avoid a likelihood of jeopardy or to avoid, to avoid an incidental take um, exceedance. Um, you know, the, there's just really no evidence, and I think if you read plaintiff's own declarance declaration, there's no easy answer here, and as I think Mr. Weiner said it himself, if it was as simple as raising the lake levels, we would have done that a long time ago. We wish it was that simple. And, and again, going back to sort of what's before the court, is it something that needs to be done between now and when this case is decided on the merits? It's just an extraordinary request without really sufficient evidentiary support. Okay. All right, is there anything else that you want to uh, add with respect to? Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, we, we've covered the, the, the main points. I think it's just important with respect to the, the Bureau's operation of the project. We, we discussed that in the brief. There's never been a time when the Bureau has intentionally managed the lake below the elevations that were predicted in the biological opinion. Nine of the times that it's happened was because of a glitch and the formula that was being used. It took them a while to figure out why the lake wasn't responding the way they thought it would. They fixed that glitch, and since that time, there have only been three occasions. Um, one occasion was one one-hundredth of a foot, um, and two others were when Pacificor released um, flows for flood control unbeknownst to reclamation. We've taken corrective action, actions to make sure that doesn't recur. So in terms of operation of the project, under this biological opinion. I think it's entirely reasonable for the Bureau to continue operating under this biological opinion. The Fish and Wildlife Service is on record here having said that they don't believe doing so would be, be jeopardy, would not create um, an incidental take exceedance. Um, there has been no recorded incidental take exceedance in the five years that this biological opinion has been in, in place, and I can't stress that enough. That's why this is not the salmon case. This well, right. no, it's, I, I agree that it's that the evidence is different. It's it's much harder, I think, in the lake to make that uh, draw that conclusion one way or another. That that's what it seems. Um, but I I do appreciate that distinction. Absolutely, Your Honor. Um, I think I, I think I've, I've covered sort of the, the basic points. Unless the court has any further questions. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Paul Simmons for the interveners. Um, the court has properly recognized that a preliminary injunction is always an extraordinary and dramatic remedy, more so when it's uh, mandatory injunctive relief. And in this particular case, it would also be a catastrophic remedy for agricultural communities. We're at, you're being asked to close down rural communities with this proposed order. And we've provided you with the declarations. And Your Honor has asked the question, um, can you consider the equities? And because certainly we we're aware that in the prior rulings, the court uh, found that it could not. And whatever our views about that, that was in a permanent injunction context. This is a preliminary injunction. 
where the plaintiffs have, have not demonstrated they will succeed on the merits of this case. So some degree, that has to be factored into the weighing and balancing, as other district courts have recognized in the Eastern District of California and in the District of Oregon. So it is appropriate to consider other interests. Well, I think I said that at the, at the yes, outset. Your Honor. And, and I, I agree with you. I think in the context of, um, of the preliminary injunction, I, the evidence has to be very clear. The, the burden is, is very high on the plaintiffs uh, to start with. And with all of the competing interests, and as I've indicated before, uh, I understand how serious the implications are to everybody. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the law tells me that the interest of the endangered species is, is paramount. But I've got to be confident that uh, what I was doing uh, was actually going to, uh, was necessary and effective. Correct. So that, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and maybe to um, start then where I thought I might end up, is, and this, Mr. Williams mentioned this too, but you do not have a declaration that says that this remedy will prevent an irreparable harm that would otherwise be anticipated. The declarant speaks of a great concern about a risk of a, of a big event like has been described, the mass mortality, but it doesn't say well, if you issue this injunction, that won't happen. So that's an important fact in terms of the plaintiff's burden. I'd like to talk about some of the other things that have come up. First, whether the Bureau of Reclamation has actually reinitiated consultation because of what its letter said in 2017. Your Honor, I and many people in this room have been in large meetings at the Shiloh Inn in Klamath Falls where there was a presentation about how the reconsultation was going as early as a year ago, more, well more than a year ago, and it does concern coho, it does concern suckers, and the Bureau of Reclamation is obligated as a matter of law to consider the best available science on each when it reconsults. So that is just simply not right. I want to address also the science, including Mr. Weiner's testimony this morning, uh, related to the, the state of affairs and what's going on. And, Your Honor, earlier you said facts matter, and that is, that is the theme of the science. You're being asked to, take, to impose this remedy based on this new information, and you have a declarant in the reply declaration saying, we attended a meeting on Janu January 20, 31st, 2018, and we told them this. Told them what? There was a presentation in November of 2017 about what? Where, where is the presentation? We don't have it. You don't have it. And that's the basis now for this drastic remedy. It makes no sense. Um, so I do want to talk about the science. And the other thing I wanted to, to note uh, preliminarily, not only are they considering information for the consultation, but there's also a so-called status review going on with respect to suckers, which is mandatory under the ESA. So everyone who's got anything to say is required to, or if you want to be heard, unload in that status review that's going on in parallel. Which is a Federal Register notice that I haven't cited. But um, anyway, that's also occurring. Um, and, and, and in talking about this, I also want to talk about the claim that the 2013 biological opinion pretended there was no science after 2007, the USGS report, which is objectively false. And, and we can talk about that as we go forward. Um, so I want to talk, if I could, about the science issues. One is the critical issue for the suckers, I think everyone understands, is recruitment. Um, that is to say, they're getting good production of the larval fish and juveniles, and then they're not making it to adulthood to reproduce. So the adults that are reproducing are largely um, older fish. And um, one of the interesting things um, in, the, in the National Academy of Sciences report, uh, which is, um, I'll find the citation, Your Honor. It's uh, document 42.5. Um, in, in that report, um, they, they indicate that this phenomenon of going long periods of time, like decades, without this successful recruitment is actually not unique to, to these particular suckers. It's happened to suckers in Utah, happened to suckers in Nevada. And I, and I don't say that 
to minimize this concern because it's legitimate, it's real. But they had some success in balancing those things back with habitat restoration activities and what have you. And that's cause for hope, in my opinion. But with respect to recruitment, um, what we do know is that the year of best recruitment, the, the class that survived the best in recent history, was 1991. The 1991 spawn. 1991 was a year of very low water levels, and as um, Mr. Johnson explains, that was a year when lake levels were well below what they even can go below now. And Mr. Janney from the USGS, he confirms that the best time was the early 1990s. Those years, 90, 91, 92, 94, people back there can tell you, those were the droughtiest years we've seen. Those were years of extremely low lake levels. In 1994, the lake went lower than it has ever gone since the dam was constructed in the 1920s. So National Academy of Sciences, USGS, everyone says you can't, you're not going to fix it by manipulating the climate project, the recruitment problem. With respect to the fish mortality, um, I'll rely on, the, on a, the Blue Ribbon National Research Council who concluded that there's no basis for believing that raising the lake can prevent these events. Uh, the National Research Council pointed out the, that the year of highest lake elevation in the last 50 years was a year of the greatest mass mortality of fish in Upper Klamath Lake. Um, and Mr. Mot uh, Johnson's testimony shows that the large mortality is generally associated with higher than lower. And Mr. Janney from the US Geological Survey, um, his declaration highlights that in six of the seven years when these events have occurred, the lake elevation was at or above what the plaintiffs are requesting here. So over a period of time, like 50 years, you've had seven of these events, six of the seven, the lake elevation was at roughly what they're, the plaintiff is requesting or above. Um, and the point again is facts matter. You can't ignore that. Um, th the plaintiffs are arguing for an elevation that has resulted in mortalities if there's a causal relationship at all, which is probably the real question. 1994, the year of the lowest elevations ever. No fish mortality. So that, that brings me to water quality. And um, here again, National Research Council, National Research Council, Blue Ribbon National Panel, um, found no scientific support for the notion that higher elevations mean better water quality. And that was, that's document 425 at pages 126 and 248. And the USGS, US Geological Survey has found the same thing in their report 2007. What we've now heard is, well, you, um, you have to have a multivariate analysis of this type of thing because it's complicated, and it is. But if you look at the US Geological Survey study, if you look at it, uh, which is document 45.1 on pages 44 to 50, uh, it has an in-depth discussion of a multivariate analysis for upper Klamath Lake water quality. And it reaches the conclusion, ultimately, that it seems that uh, water temperature and wind are probably the big, fact, you know, in terms of the variables that might affect this. But they didn't draw definitive conclusions about that. It's just based on what they could determine. And um, also, the only declarant who purports to have expertise in water quality uh, and lake levels has more or less using those materials reach the same, the same conclusions and they're presented. And I now want to go to the, to the representation that the biological opinion didn't consider post-2007 water quality information. Um, and I need to talk there about a representation and a declaration. In his first declaration, Mr. Butner describes these various studies, a report 2010, uh, Kahn, I think it's Walsh, Kahn, uh, oh, no, Walker and Kahn, these reports that were the basis for the 2010 testimony. And, uh, and, and then it goes on to say, Mr. Butner um, says, um, 
this information was not considered in the 2013 biological opinion. And he cites the 2013 biological opinion at section 2.1.1. That's uh, page 18 of the second declaration, page line seven to eight. He says it was not considered. So if we go to the source cited, it says nothing of the sort. It doesn't say we didn't consider certain information. What it does say is there's this water rights adjudication going on out there. It's been going on for 40 years. It may go on for another 40. That's what these guys are for. Um, and um, that may ultimately affect the way water is managed in this basin, but that's too speculative to consider. That is all that it says. It makes no mention of science. And lo and behold, if you look at the bibliography of the biological opinion, uh, I see Con 2010. I see Con and Walker 2010. I see Con and Walker 2012. I don't think the biological opinion ignored any of this information. And so now we're just being asked to make a decision about what somebody else is saying, and we don't even know really what that is. The Pelican Bay issue, um, you know, it relates to water quality is there access to Pelican Bay. Fish, apparently some of the you know, suckers will move in there when lake water quality gets bad. Um, it's up in the northwest corner and um, the, they have springs that come into Pelican Bay that are better water quality, so they'll come in and they'll go out. Several years ago, this concern about the depth of, the, uh, whether there was access at certain elevations was a real concern. That was pretty much laid to rest in 2012. And all we're being told now is that somebody objects to the bathymetry that was used in that biological opinion. No idea what that even means other than someone has heartburn with it. That's the basis for this concern. I also heard that, I actually was told by um, a couple of folks that fished that they saw the USGS pick up two suckers. One of, and they actually thought that maybe someone had caught the suckers, but that's my testimony, and I, and I certainly can't tell you. Yeah, I think we're going a little far beyond what, what you need to argue, but so go Yeah, ahead. all right. Well, Your Honor, I'd be happy to talk about thresholds in much further detail, um, which are, I just remind you, have nothing whatsoever to do with biology. Uh, they're a, st a numerically derived, derived mathematical formula, and there's much to be said about them but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about anything. Okay, uh, good. Thank you, Mr. Simmons, very mm -hmm. much. Mr. Warner. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, multiple things, frankly. Uh, let's, let's start with the recruitment question uh, because recruitment absolutely is a bottleneck. Uh, but if we talk, if what we're hearing about from the 90s and when there was recruitment and the relationships that do or don't exist, I think there are, are several important considerations that need to be borne in mind about what the, the link they're asking you to draw between higher water quality and poor, higher water quantity and poorer recruitment that simply is not borne out in the data. Um, you're hearing about 1991, which was a low water year. But what they are not mentioning is that what 1991 also was, was one of the coldest and windiest springs ever in the basin. And why that is so critical is that that contributed to one of the smallest algae blooms that has ever occurred. And so the water quality in the lake in 1991 was better than it almost has ever been since the inception of major agriculture in the basin. And so that what they're trying to say about the correlation they want you to draw between simply, again, a one-to-one -one relationship between lower lake levels or higher lake levels in recruitment misses the point and does not engage with what we are saying is a really important thing looking at the various factors. 1994 was another terrible water year. He's absolutely correct about that. Suckers are, by and large, a resilient species, and they survived 1994. But what happened after they survived 1994? They were massive die-offs in 95 and 96 and 97. And so you can't simply look at the year that the species might have been born in isolation because these are also slow maturing species. Even if you get over the hump with a, single, with a year zero juvenile, they've got to live another four or five years to be able to actually spawn and produce new young. And if you do not have the opportunity for them to survive that way, you will not have any more fish. And that really is the core of what we are saying on the merits of our Jeopardy claim. 
So let's talk, we'll talk about the merits a little bit uh, because I think that that is really important because I think what we are seeing, they keep talking about they want to continue operating under the 2013 buy-up, which was a no jeopardy buy-up. And the trend lines that we are seeing and continue to see, that can't possibly reflect an absence of jeopardy. And again, we're not saying that the buy-up was wrong when it was initiated. What we are saying is that the assumptions that went into it and the management that reclamation has performed under it are in fact causing jeopardy to the species. And it's true for both the Chuam and the COP2, but the COP2 are even the more egregious example where the numbers simply continue to plummet and to plummet. And unless we do everything that we possibly can to keep the existing adults alive while we try to figure out what the recruitment bottleneck is, there won't be any more fish to produce new recruits. And that is really the exigency of the situation we're looking at. And, the com and so that is what they, again, want to distract you from. That it is exigency, but it is also that water levels, at the levels that we are requesting, are in fact geared toward making a difference and toward being as protective of the species as possible within the parameters we have control over. If it's a terrible water quality year, which it is this year, making sure they have access to the refuge is essential and making sure that within the water quality refuge of Pelican Bay, that they are not placed into greater lethal danger is critical and that is what the water elevations are geared to do. It is too late this year for have the water levels make a big difference for water quality. That ship has sailed for this year. Um, I do wanna to touch on, at one point Mr. Williams had mentioned, you know, we're asking for year round issues. We put those levels in there because we don't know how long the pendency of this litigation is going to take, and that is, the, that is the cycle we are looking for. We recognize that this is a preliminary injunction at this stage. And so what that means is hopefully we will have a ruling on the merits in advance, for example, of the next irrigation season, and we'll be able to address the appropriate levels, including their interplay with flood control and with coho needs in the spring, on the merits at that time. We put these in there now because we believe they're what the best available science shows is the most protective thing for the fish who are required to be given the benefit of the doubt. I mean, at core, the problem is that reclamation has continued to squeeze the fish and squeeze the fish and squeeze the fish, which is the opposite of what the Endangered Species Act requires them to do. And that really gets to the merits of the Jeopardy claim. On the take claim, the 2013 buy-up itself uh, in section 13.2.2 basically says, you know, we can't really measure take. We think we're making conservative assumptions. We have a proxy for entrainment. We don't really have any way to tell how much is being taken. But as the project continues to drain water out of that lake, fish are entrained, fish are subject to habitat conditions, and because of the qualitative nature of the incidental take statement, which had to do with the assumptions that were built into the 2013 buy-up that were, have not proven true, we believe that that therefore puts them outside of what that incidental take statement allowed them to do and therefore calls into question whether they can continue to shelter under its safe harbor. And that's the merits of take. It's not that we can say, look, you took 72 fish instead of 71, which is the standard they're trying to hold us to, which is inconsistent with what they said in their own buy-up, that it's really hard to do this. And in fact, we don't know how to do it quantitatively. If you look at the incidental take reports, that reclamation has produced every year from 2013 to 2017. Every year, when it comes to the effects, of, the effects on take of the habitat diminishments, they say, we can't count it, so we'll assume there's none. That's a fundamentally arbitrary decision, and that goes to the merits of our take claim and why we think we are likely to prevail on it. Uh, but again, the, it really, the, the core really comes back to we need to try to make sure these fish can stay alive. That is what the Endangered Species Act commands. And what we are saying, and the science demonstrates, is that lake levels are an important variable in that factor to give them the opportunity that they have to survive adverse water quality situations, to have the habitat that provides the best chance both for survival and then also for spawning and recruitment going forward to try to move over those bottlenecks. Because we are at such a choke point now that we don't have time we do not have time to find the perfect fix to these things. You hear about how long the buyout process is going to take. You hear about we are uncertain, you know, the science is not definitive on what these things go. The Endangered Species Act does not require the best possible science. It does not require metaphysical certitude. It requires the best available science and it requires deploying it to prevent endangered species from going extinct. 
And that is what we're asking to do here, and that is what we believe the science shows. Um, Mr. Simmons talks about, you know, we're asking you to rely on a presentation. We're not asking you to rely on a presentation, Your Honor. We have gone through in great detail in Mr. Buechner's declarations the underlying technical basis for the conservation levels we're proposing. We mention that presentation simply so that there is no dispute on the face of the record, that this is information available to and that the services and the federal defendants are clearly aware of. These are federal contractors, Your Honor. That's the point that we raise that for, not that we're saying, hey, we got a PowerPoint that we want you to make a monumental decision on. That's not what we're doing. That's not the case we've presented to you. Um, Mr. Simmons touched briefly on bathymetry and disputes on bathymetry and, oh, yeah, we got that fixed in the 2013 buy-up. Um, I'll just direct you to the Fish and Wildlife Service technical report, document 44-1. Um, in addition to continuing to analyze the water quality and lake level relationship, the service will be considering new science related Just slow to down. Sorry, I apologize. Um, the service... The service will be considering new science related to Upper Klamath Lake bathymetry. I mean, it, it, it's right there. They are acknowledging that there are issues that need to be addressed, that it is not, as Mr. Simmons would have you think, that Pelican Bay access is all sewn up tight. Uh, and in fact, the data that they relied on in the 2013 biop, rather than the physically done, long-standing 1992 bathymetry that we talk about in our, in our declarations, um, was newly done work that had not been quality controlled, which they acknowledged in the buyout. Um, and so they sort of built in a half foot buffer just in case the data happened to be off. What's come out since then, and this was information in the reply declaration, again, these are federal contractors, this is information that they're fully aware of, is that they're showing that there's consistently a one to two foot bias in the data they relied on in the bathymetry. It's part of why they acknowledge they have to look at it again. The consultant that they cite in the technical report is the same consultant that we talked about where, again, Mr. Buechner was attending a presentation uh, that reflects that bias. And so, in fact, the bias in the 2013 biop when it comes to bathymetry works very directly against the fish and their ability to access the water quality refugia. That is not giving them the benefit of the doubt. That is not trying to make sure that jeopardy can be avoided. And that is information at the 2013 buy-up. Again, you, we don't require perfect science. They didn't have perfect science in the 2013 buy-up. They used what they thought was the most reliable thing to hand, which, which is appropriate. Um, it has turned out to have been wrong and therefore puts the fish in a much greater degree of peril than the 2013 buy-up analyzed. Uh, and that, and that, goes, that again goes to both, both take and to jeopardy. Um, also, I would like to, again, just to go to the, the Fish and Wildlife Service technical report. Uh, Mr. Williams pointed to it and read you the excerpt from it talking about, yeah, they've been talking about suckers the whole way along. How much more clearly could they say it? Well, what they said is that it is just one part of the broad and complex scientific landscape that will be assessed. They didn't say that we have been and will continue to assess. Right? There, there's no representation in here that they've been doing this since January of 2017 when they want to tell you that they began reconsultation. This is purely perspective. And this is purely perspective as of three and a half weeks ago. Let me briefly address the concern you raised about uh, count three and the uh, no fisheries. Okay, go um, ahead. Which is that our, our theory there is that because of the joint nature of this buyout, because the agencies, the consulting agencies worked on it and put it together, we believe that your analysis in the Yurok and the Hoopa case, based on the Ninth Circuit case law, that the consulting agencies, as well as the action agencies, action agency, have an obligation to reinitiate consultation because of the particular specific facts and process that led to the promulgation of this biop and the consultation that was done between the agencies, between the consulting agencies to make sure that the various pieces of it harmonized. For that reason, we submit that although the United States is correct that the statutory lines are drawn, that here on the facts of this case and on the way that this consultation has been handled, that NIMPS is a co-equal consulting agency with Fish and Wildlife Service and that the duty applies to both of them on these facts. Right. And that would be true if consultation hadn't been, uh, or that might be true uh, if consultation hadn't been uh, reinitiated. 
except I would, I would. And I understand your argument right. with respect to that. Okay. That the, the, the consultation that was reinitiated is not the consultation, not the complete consultation that was required yeah. at that point in time. Yeah. No, I understand. I, okay. understand I appreciate that. that. I guess if you have no further questions, I believe that covers the bulk of our presentation. Um, what I, I just want to, to leave you with is that, one, there is, in fact, a dramatic exigency. Two, that based on what has unfolded and based simply on the condition of the species themselves and the fact that they are continuing a steady and now accelerating march toward extinction, um, that raises significant concerns about jeopardy and about take. Uh, that we believe strongly cut in our favor on the merits, and that the remedy that we are asking you to impose is in fact warranted to preserve these species, to help them through, to help them survive the adverse conditions they are immediately facing so that they continue to exist so that there is the prospect of recovering them. This is not a recovery claim, but recovery is part of the Jeopardy analysis, and that the water levels that we are asking for are scientifically sound for purposes of being able to give the fish the best opportunity they have to survive. It is not a one-to-one -one fix. It is not that if you do this, we will guarantee that the fish survive. But that's not what the Endangered Species Act requires. That's not what the law requires. What we need to be able to do in a situation like this is to preserve the opportunity for them to survive. And where there are variables beyond our control, we can't control those, but what these water levels that we are asking for do, based on the science that we presented to you, is that interfacing with the variables that we can't control, they are the piece that give the fish the best chance to make it to next season. And that really is what we're asking you to rule on, Your Honor. Uh, to the extent that you are not willing to go that far, and presuming that you are willing to keep venue in this court, which we submit as appropriate and which we request, um, but let me also add, to the extent that you are not willing to keep venue, we would request, rather than a dismissal, a transfer to the District of Oregon. Uh, if, that, if that is where we land, we would make that request. Um, yeah, I don't intend to dismiss the case. Okay. Uh, I think uh, everybody in this courtroom recognizes the seriousness of the issue with respect uh, to, the, um, to the species, and the issue is what can be done uh, effectively to uh, to address that concern and uh, and then there are the the legal issues give uh, this is a uh, a complicated case to develop sufficient evidence to get to uh, the place that you want to get to uh, where and uh, and I uh, and I applaud the um, uh, the efforts that that you've made to get there um, but uh, and I'm going to look uh, when I get off the bench uh, at them and I will look again at the venue issue one more time um, but I'm uh, as I'm leaving the bench I'm I will say I'm impressed with the argument but I'm not convinced that uh, that you've met the high burden that you have to just because it's a hard to show the take rates. The experts are not uh, in agreement. Uh, what you're asking for is uh, extraordinary, uh, and it will have, uh, it, and it might have uh, good benefits uh, uh, for the, uh, the species, uh, but it will have direct negative implications on everybody else. So, uh, so th those are all the things that I'm thinking about as I leave the bench. If I may speak to that just briefly, Your Honor, um, and we certainly respect that, to the extent that you feel like that we have not made our burden and that you are concerned about the scientific uncertainty that exists, uh, we would make an alternate request, which is that if you are not willing to grant the preliminary injunction that we seek, uh, we would ask that you direct a specific technical process to occur involving the federal agencies, involving other stakeholders, involving the Lower River tribes, and involving our technical people. Because as you're hearing from Mr. Williams, we don't really know when the reconsultation is going to finish. And what we would therefore request is a directed and focused technical process to take an immediate and serious look 
at this lake level interface. If we're not going to get the injunction we seek today, then we do have a window of time before the next irrigation season and the decisions are made about elevations and some of the impacts that Mr. Simmons has been talking about can be ameliorated because what they need to be able to do is plan. To be able to use the window that we may then have, because if we're not going to get the injunction we want, the chips are going to fall where they may this season and either the suckers will survive August and September or they will not. Um, and obviously it is our fervent hope and prayer that they do. But there is then a window of time for a focused technical effort that we are prepared to engage with as robustly as we possibly can and as quickly as we possibly can to take a hard look at this particular issue to see, assuming the suckers survive this year, what we can put in place for next year from the start of the season that would be more protective of the suckers than what Reclamation says they intend to continue to do, which is just to operate as the 2013 buy-up is perfectly fine. That would be an alternate request we would make of you. Um, I would expect there may be some opposition to that for that it will detract from the reconsultation effort. But frankly, Your Honor, we don't know when that's going to end and we really don't know that we can wait that long. And so to the extent the remedy we're asking for is too extraordinary, um, that would be an alternative request that we would make to allow us to really put a hard focus on exactly the questions you are identifying about where the science says we need to be and what the effectiveness of the remedy that we are seeking will be and to do it on a time frame that it can actually try to provide some benefit to the fish rather than this indefinite, indefinite limbo, the risk of which only falls on the fish. So um, my reaction to that is uh, that uh, it is my uh, hope that there will be a hard focus on this uh, issue because it's clearly an important one. Um, it is my expectation, no matter who has this case, uh, that uh, if this issue hasn't been worked well, there may be another motion come the spring. Uh, I don't think I'm going to, um, uh, assuming that I stick with my determination with, uh, with respect to venue, I, I'm not going to tie the hands of the transferee judge on what is uh, the, the appropriate way to, uh, to move the case forward. So I'm, uh, I will, I'll keep your request in mind, uh, but I think I'm unlikely to um, do anything that um, would require a different thing. I just, I, I make the comments that I make advisedly to uh, everyone. This is, uh, it's a serious issue that, that I don't think anybody really has a clear handle on what's going to be happening uh, for this year and or what's going to happen in the future and that the best people to deal with this are not um, uh, individuals in robes. Uh, they are the peop the scientists and the people who are directly involved uh, with the problems. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that that will occur. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you all very much. <laughs>